Howdy and welcome gentlemen today to Mr. East Classroom. In today's video we have one overarching goal and that's to get us all through the development of American English colonial society. By the end of today I want us all to have a decent picture, mental picture, and idea of what the 13 colonies looked like and felt like uh, going across really a century of development. So today we're going to be covering the time period roughly from the 1650s to the 1750s. The goal today is to catch us all up and get us ready to discuss the events that are going to lead up to the American Revolution. In order to do that, we're first going to have, an, have, to have an idea for what the colonies and colonial society were like uh, as they all developed over the century. In order to uh, make this work, we're going to have to cover a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I just want you guys to know that today is broad strokes, not details. And really I want to give you guys the conceptual ideas and tools that will just help you have a feel for what colonial American society was like. So we're going to cover English colonial society. I'm not calling it American colonial society yet because the people who would become Americans are not yet calling themselves Americans. We're going to cover English colonial society in three broad categories. The first is government and society generally what sort of the political scene and institutions looked like. Uh, second, we're going to cover the economy and how it developed and was important to the colonies. And third, we're going to understand or identify the ideas, um, sort of the mental picture that defined colonial life. And so that will cover sort of philosophical ideas, but also religion. Government and society. So if we were going to draw a trend that goes over 100 years from 1650 to 1750 and understand that that is a huge amount of time, a lot goes on in this time period that unfortunately we're just not going to get to be able to cover in detail. Uh, but if we had to draw one line, one trend, it is that the colonies come from a position of all being very different, very unique, with their own starting traditions and ways of doing things to becoming more standardized and more generally English in character as time goes on. What do I mean by that? Well, the colonies, local economies, and all those sorts of things are going to remain distinct in the broad categories we laid out from New England colonies, Middle colonies, and Southern colonies. But the way that they look at society, the cultural issues they're talking about, all those things and changes are, are going to become more English as we go through time. This generally means that the colonies as forms of government will come to be more similar. Uh, there will be kind of a common consensus that we can identify to represent sort of what the colonial American government looked like and what their general expectations were, but also the way that their uh, local cultures looked. So like the news that they would consume and the products they would consume and the world that they were familiar with would all come to more closely resemble the general English world than it did back in the early days of Jamestown or Plymouth when these guys were fairly isolated and doing their own unique things. Also, society's layout is going to become more normal, more English over time. Remember early on in Jamestown we had a military company rule where property was almost common and distributed from a central authority. Or in Massachusetts we had a highly regimented, religious, the almost a theocratic society. Um, both of those places are going to kind of even out, become more like the middle colonies over time, where people are living under a more normal governmental regime that we would come to expect of colonial society. A big step in this sort of standardization, normalization process came in the 1680s uh, with what's known as the Glorious Revolution, events that were happening over in England. Basically, there was a struggle over about 40 years between the various kings of England and the forces of parliament over whether royal authority or parliamentary authority would be more central in English life. The final result in 1688 with what's known as the Glorious Revolution was the triumph of parliamentary authority in England. Uh, the end result in the American colonies was kind of a standardization of the colonial relationship 
with England. Whereas before, there were all different kinds of colonies and what their statuses might be. Uh, by the time of the Glorious Revolution, you had kind of a standardized relationship where authority or the colonies officially belonged to the king, but really were mostly governed through parliament. That kind of had a relationship where there would be a royal governor or a governor appointed from England who would sort of perform the executive functions over each given colony. And then you had local assemblies that were selected men from the colonies who would sort of handle um, some basic legislative functions, but usually perform kind of an advisory role to the governors. The exact authorities and powers of the governors and the assemblies would vary by state. Um, tra local traditions did still prevail, but that's the general picture that we're seeing. One that we would kind of recognize in the later form of government America would adopt, where we had a very proud, vibrant legislative sort of government or an assembly-based government, but also with a strong executive figure. The key being here that executive power came from England, and as we'll see when tensions rise uh, with England, that will cast sort of some um, suspicion against executive power in the colonies. The general policy of England towards the colonies that emerged by the end of the 1600s is what is known as salutary neglect which is where England basically didn't fiddle with local colonial government. They let them do their own things. They didn't tax them very much. The idea being that if they were left alone, all the colonists would have to do is agree basically to mostly trade directly with England under things that were called the Navigation Acts. This basically meant that, the, that England wouldn't interfere with the colonies too much if the colonies agreed to behave. And uh, the colonies came to sort of expect this relationship. They enjoyed it because it let the colonists do their own thing and focus on making money and building an economy without um, annoying forms of taxation. One reason the English were okay with this arrangement is because they had a bigger fish to fry. They were concerned with European affairs or their attention was directed to their much more profitable Caribbean colonies. An important thing to understand is that at this time, the American colonies weren't seen as especially um, wealthy or really profitable to the mother country. More important, uh, they were as a uh, sort of consumer society for manufactured English goods. The exact makeup of society would vary across regions. So here what I have up for you, the language that's written in is German. Uh, but this is a map of ethnic distribution across America. So as we can see, the blue is where the majority population was English. Um, this would be later on into the 1700s. The yellow areas is where the majority population was actually African slave. Uh, we have a couple other groups. So the orange up in the New York area was largely Dutch. Um, the sort of red color is German and Swiss and the uh, green color is uh, Scotch-Irish, which is important to distinguish from the normal Irish that we'll see come later in time. The Scotch-Irish were largely Protestant and from Northern Ireland. But as we can see, the, the broad ethnic makeup of the colonies is overwhelmingly English or people from the British Isles. Um, these people were overwhelmingly Protestant, although there were many different Protestant denominations to note. In the South, um, Episcopalianism, or excuse me, Anglicanism, which will later become Episcopalianism, uh, the Church of England basically was dominant. In the north, it was a Congregationalist churches. And across the middle, you'd have different denominations like Quakers, um, eventually Presbyterians and Methodists. But overwhelmingly Protestant, English-speaking, white people. In the south, you have a very large slave population. In fact, at the beginning of the nation, the African population is the largest in proportion to total population it will ever be. So actually when the colonies uh, declare independence, about 20% of the population will be African, uh, overwhelmingly enslaved, and that's the highest it will ever be. Today, for instance, the African American population is about 14%, so even down from what it was in the colonial days. Who held political power would kind of vary uh, by region, but the general theme was that landed white men held power. 
Now, pretty much everyone who's considered a citizen at this time is white. The only other two groups we could mention would be Native Americans, but they're mostly excluded from American society and will exist on the margins, outside settled areas, and weren't considered part of the general society. They were considered to be mostly foreign nations. Um, and Africans were, in some cases, they were granted some powers of political participation if they were free. Um, but overwhelmingly, they're enslaved and not considered part of the citizenry. So the people who hold power are all white. Uh, they're men. And at the time, suffrage and the ability to per participate in government was dictated by uh, wealth, which was usually held in land. Um, one important thing to note, however, is in America, more than really any other place in the developed world at this time, there's a broad distribution of land, which meant that a whole lot of people, compared to Europe, uh, actually could vote or participate in politics. Um, something like, I I believe 50%, it was either 25% or 50%, a high proportion of men uh, could vote at this time. And so that's not at all everyone. It's not a democratic society, but you have a large proportion of the men in the society participating in politics. Of course, the only people expected to actually hold significant public office are going to be the very wealthy elite of society. And that's sort of a deferential political order that we'll talk about later. So the economy. The key point we want to hit here is that the colonies existed in a growing market economy. Remember, the whole point that England was interested in colonial activity was to build wealth, to get wealth. Um, and that meant that there had to be trade at least between England and the colonies. Now you've probably heard of the triangle trade at some point before. That's the name given to the system of Atlantic trade where um, Basically, you had a, there were multiple triangles. There wasn't just one triangle. But basically, there's trade going from North America to Europe and to Africa back and forth. Generally, the product, or I hate to call it a product, generally the item coming from Africa was slaves. Um, those were brought to all parts of the New World and other parts of the world, too. Uh, we'll look at that more in depth in class. The goods coming from the New World were usually raw materials, like tobacco, cotton, sugar, listed here. And usually manufactured goods would leave Europe for the other places. By the mid-1700s, the colonists are not living in some isolated state. They're very interconnected with the rest of the world. Um, they care about markets and market fluctuations. They're consuming many consumer products. And by and large, they're very well informed about things going on the, in the world as newspapers become more common. The main economic differences to note between the colonial regions are the basic ones we've already looked at. The South is overwhelmingly growing large cash crops. The middle colonies have kind of a balanced economy. Um, a lot of financial institutions will pop up in places like New York City, but generally they have a mixed economy where they're growing some grains, they have some very, well, not very much manufacturing yet at this point, but some trade and commerce. And New England will focus very heavily on the shipping industry. And so actually a relationship will grow up between New England and the South. So the South grows raw agricultural product, New England will often ship it, and New England will make business out of uh, dealing in slaves in the Atlantic slave trade. Generally speaking, by the uh, mid-1700s, the 13 colonies will, will become the first American states are very economically prosperous and things are on the up and up. So Americans are feeling pretty, or the uh, English colonists are feeling pretty confident in their economic position, much more so than the early days where people were struggling for basic existence. Lastly, we have to talk about ideas and religion. What were people thinking? What were they feeling? What were they arguing about? Um, something I want to set up to consider for this class is sort of a, a dichotomy, a dialectic, a back-and-forth tension between the ideas of extreme faith and extreme sort of uh, rationalism. One sort of uh, comparing or, or contrasting uh, couplet we set up earlier was that between North and South, the growing differences between New England and the Southern states where you have sort of a, 
agricultural society based on money making uh, versus sort of this idealistic northern society. Uh, of course, the north will become less strictly idealistic, and then you'll have sort of an agrarian and commercial society split. But the split we want to talk about here is between uh, sort of an extreme evangelical Christianity, or maybe extreme is not the word, maybe intense and zealous is the word, and then a sort of very uh, secular, at, at times almost atheistic um, rationalism that will dominate sort of American public discourse. So a major intellectual force that grew up uh, especially in Europe, but which also spread amongst the elite in America, uh, is what's known as the Enlightenment. So during the Enlightenment, you had many philosophers and many thinkers who increasingly looked for natural explanations for how things functioned in the world and increasingly believed that they could come to know and explain most things about the world um, in scientific or rational terms. Now, what that usually meant is that they could come to explain things in terms that didn't involve religion and didn't involve um, faith or sort of a traditionalist outlook on the world. That basically human reason could understand most of the functionings of the world and that um, well, really most questions could be solved and fixed with reason and that human societies could be perfected and improved using human reason. So the figure I have here to represent sort of the Enlightenment side is John Locke, who is an English political philosopher, someone hopefully we'll get to talk about in class. But he, uh, among other things, revolutionized the way Englishmen thought about politics. So he would paint a picture of uh, the social contract, an idea that thinkers like Hobbes and Rousseau will also talk about. But he will sort of argue that political societies are formed by the consent of the governed and that, says that government should uh, meet the needs of the governed. So sort of a consent-based political order uh, where men made society and uh, well, generally promote the social contract theory. His ideas would uh, kind of come into tension with traditional monarchical views, views that supported kingship uh, and associate views, and it would become more and more prevalent as a political current uh, later and later in the 1700s. But on the other side, we had uh, sort of intellectual currents, or anti-intellectual currents, you could almost call them at times, that argued that there were strong limits on human reason and that people needed to turn to God, faith, and religion in order to either improve society or to save society from going astray. In America, we had what was known as the First Great Awakening uh, throughout sort of the mid and early 1700s. And so to represent that movement, we have here George Whitfield, who was a very prominent preacher um, as I've said before, America was overwhelmingly Protestant in religious composition. Uh, George Whitfield began as a Church of England Anglican preacher, but became a Methodist. And so he was actually a leader in the development of early Methodism. Um, other churches that will emerge in America are the Presbyterians, for instance, and the Baptists, um, all evangelical Protestant groups. These groups were less interested in sort of the high church intellectualist approach of many Church of England ministers and were more interested in what's known as a low church approach that was very sort of um, emotionally based. It was less of a, of a mental experience and more of an emotional experience where you were supposed to have a personal relationship with God. And uh, there's a large emphasis on large public preaching uh, familiarizing yourself with the Bible and Scripture, and uh, trusting more to religious faith than sort of a rationalistic Enlightenment approach to the world. Over time, the prevalence of these two broad traditions will ebb and flow. So at times, society is more uh, scientistic, more rationalistic in its approach, and at other times, there will be a sort of an awakening. We have many awakenings, great awakenings, um, in American history, and we also have many periods where Americans are more of a rationalist bent. I just want you to know that throughout colonial society, 
these are very strong currents. So you couldn't say that Americans are all very religious in their approach to life, and you couldn't say that they're all very rationalistic. As a general approach, what I would tell you, though, is that most Americans, especially of middle and lower class um, status, will be very religious, very uh, and Protestant in their approach to life. But among the political elite, what you will find is large numbers of uh, more enlightenment-leaning rationalist thinkers. So that's, that's a broad picture for what the intellectual scene looked throughout the time period. Now, I know we had to gallop through a lot of this. We talked about a lot of very broad subjects, but I hope that uh, all put together you have a basic idea for what American or, or rather colonial society looked like for the century preceding the revolution. Uh, we'll talk more about it in class. I want you to have any questions you might have about it. Please, please bring those to me in class. And uh, until then, I hope you have a good day.